Welcome back to the Green Swindle. Now, President Obama's answer to the so-called problem of global warming is one of the most controversial solutions being shopped today. Every little bit of pollution that is sent up into the atmosphere, uh, that polluter is getting charged for it. It is the system known as cap and trade, but what does it actually mean? The government caps how much CO2 companies and industries can produce and then allows them to trade credits in CO2. So if one firm faces very high cost to reduce pollution and another firm has low cost to reduce pollution, the idea is the low cost firm can create credits and sell them to the other company. The idea of cap and trade is that you leave it to the marketplace to determine what measures should be used to reduce pollution. It's really a misnomer to say that cap and trade is a market-based system. At best, you might call it market socialism, because essentially you are rationing energy use. Where did this idea of carbon trading come from? Like many things related to the current administration, it can be traced back to Obama's hometown and a company called the Chicago Climate Exchange, or the CCX. The company declined an interview request, but in an email to Fox News, a spokesperson explains that CCX's purpose is to, quote, help prepare businesses and markets for potential regulations at the international or federal level while reducing greenhouse gas emissions through a rules-based exchange platform. The founder of CCX is Richard Sandor, named by Time Magazine as the father of carbon trading. He was one of the leaders in saying, why don't we get out early and start a climate exchange for greenhouse gases? So he went and got foundation grants from some liberal foundations like the Joyce Foundation, at the time one of whose board members was a guy named Barack Obama. The company originated with two grants from the Chicago-based Joyce Foundation, whose president, Paula DiPerna, soon left to become the executive vice president of CCX. Senior White House advisor Valerie Jarrett was the foundation's former director. Usually you don't need foundation funding to set up a, um, a commodities exchange. There's usually plenty of private money because uh, there's usually lots of profit in uh, trading commodities. Well, carbon is different uh, because we're going to make that market uh, artificially. In 2006, CCX was acquired by Climate Exchange PLC, which was then acquired in July of this year by Intercontinental Exchange for approximately $600 million. Among those who may have benefited financially, Sandor himself, who owned nearly 17% of shares, Al Gore's company, Generation Investment Management, and Goldman Sachs, which at one point owned as much as 10%. There's a lot of green to be made in being green. Now, despite CCX's arguments in favor of a cap-and-trade system, many scientists and economists maintain not only is it a bad idea, it is also nearly impossible to implement. Climatologist and former NASA scientist Dr. Roy Spencer says that the energy technology necessary to make a large-scale switch from fossil fuels does not yet exist. You cannot legislate new forms of energy into existence. Dr. Spencer also argues that the climate system is much less sensitive to CO2 than most experts claim, and that CO2 in the atmosphere might not even be a bad thing. Cap and trade might make people feel good about themselves, that we're actually doing something to help the environment. But it's not going to have any measurable impact on future global temperatures. Others argue against cap and trade's practicality if President Obama wants us to reduce emissions to their 1990 levels by 2020 and reduce them an additional 80 percent by 2050. What does that actually mean in practical terms? It means reducing our fossil fuel energy use to a level the United States last experienced 100 years ago. Most of all, critics argue what the system would mean for an already struggling economy. Cap and trade is a mechanism for punishing the use of fossil fuels so that other sources of energy, which are inherently more expensive, will become more attractive. The Washington Times stated in 2009 that Obama's climate plan could cost industry close to two trillion dollars. That's nearly three times the White House's initial estimate. Where do the energy companies get their money? They get it from ratepayers. They get it from people who buy gasoline and natural gas and electricity. So eventually the consumer pays 100% of the tab. Under my plan, uh, of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Once people saw that it was a huge tax increase folded into their energy bills, uh, then people saw the economic impact not only on their pocketbook but also on American jobs and American competitiveness around the world. 
The greatest amount of experience that anyone has with cap and trade is in the European uh, trading scheme, and they've been dabbling in this uh, for a couple of years now. You've had a number of companies in Europe that have shut down factories or move out of Europe completely into developing nations that aren't suppressing their carbon dioxide emissions. Yet somehow cap and trade keeps inching closer to becoming reality. The waxman markey bill, which would establish a cap and trade system here in the U.S., similar to the EU's emission trading system, narrowly passed the House last year by a vote of 219 to 212. What do you say to the 212 that voted against it? The waxman markey bill was this thousand-page monstrosity of all sorts of deals and special, uh, special arrangements for all kinds of interest groups. That'll create a lot of regulation, create a lot of work for lawyers, create a lot of work for lobbyists. It won't do much uh, to make us a wealthier or greener society. The bill is currently sitting in the Senate. I look forward to continuing this work with the Senate so that Congress can send me a bill that I can sign into law. Politicians are more interested in gaining power than they are in improving our economy. Either that or they're just plain stupid. They really don't care whether the science is right or wrong. All they care about is that this is an opportunity to expand government. And since all of humanity requires energy, uh, this kind of legislation is a bureaucrat's dream because whoever controls energy controls the world. Still ahead, going green, it's more than a slogan, how businesses have managed to turn environmentalism into a billion dollar industry. That is next. Welcome back to the Green Swindle. Now from coast to coast, people and businesses are going green, but is this movement actually helping the environment or just lining the pockets of big corporations? The Green Revolution is the solution to the financial crisis, the national security crisis, the debt crisis, and the climate crisis. They're all connected. Ever since the 2006 debut of Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, the business of global warming has been booming, pushing its political agenda on the American people and turning huge profits. Paper plastic. Plastic. Everywhere we look, Americans are bombarded with images and products pushing the green movement and the green lifestyle. You have the media wanting to sell newspapers. Hey, what's going to be the best headline here? The truth? Climate continues changeable, not very exciting. Or the lie, world to end shock, pictures, pages 2 to 14. You have the scientists in search of grants, you have the politicians in search of an issue. You look at the grants some of these scientists are getting, they are becoming multi-millionaires at the expense of the taxpayer. Yet so far it's working. More and more companies have decided that, that they can get rich uh, off of consumers by producing and promoting products that they claim are green. The green products market in the U.S. was $209 billion in 2005. One year later, an inconvenient truth hit the screen and the market exploded. Projections say consumers will spend $420 billion on green products in 2010 and $845 billion by 2015. Al Gore's movie really jump-started the consumer awareness that somehow uh, global warming, you know, was going to cause the end of the earth as we know it in, in, in less than, you know, 10 years. And it didn't just jumpstart spending at the supermarket and the mall. Since 2005, uh, venture capital investment in the green field has essentially doubled and then doubled again. It went from basically zero to over five to six billion dollars a year in new startup companies. This entire business has really just boomed. So what is all this money being spent on? Well, it's being spread across the board from environmentally friendly cars to energy efficient light bulbs to recycled toilet paper. But there is growing concern about these products and whether they really deliver on their quote green claims. A lot of the, the claims for green products are, are, are misleading. They don't make us uh, healthier, they don't improve the environment, and they certainly don't make us happier. What they do is they raise prices for typical American consumers. So how do the companies that quote go green pull in billions? By recruiting the big guns to sell their environmental doom and gloom story, Hollywood. I'm doing what I can um, because it is an issue that I, I think 
is a global one in every sense of the word. Those env environmental disasters that have been, we've been confronting, you know, have, have been caused by us. You can't go to the movies, turn on the TV, or pick up a magazine without seeing images of the, quote, Go Green movement. So what are you to do after being made to feel so guilty about your, quote, carbon footprint? Spend more money, of course, on buying carbon offsets. Carbon offset is the idea that if your activity, say your uh, electric use and your driving use, uh, produces so much carbon dioxide, that you can offset that by buying something that will reduce an equivalent amount. For example, you can pay to participate in a project where they're planting a lot of trees. You are counteracting your uh, your own carbon dioxide emissions. Many airlines now offer the option to purchase these offsets right on their websites as part of your ticket purchase. And now the offsets themselves are their own million dollar industry. But do they really help the environment? When you buy these, these carbon credits, what you're really doing is paying to plant a tree in either China or in uh, the Amazon. That's usually where most of these carbon credits come from. It's a total scam. The global warming alarmists tell us we have to reduce our emissions immediately, whereas many of these offsets don't take effect for uh, several decades. Yet as Al Gore brings vision of Armageddon to our doorstep, he continues to travel in gas-guzzling private jets and SUVs, all under the guise that his carbon offsets will even things out. You see people like Al Gore, former vice president, claiming that uh, all of his activities are fully offset, that they, they buy carbon offsets to counteract all of the emissions that he produces from flying around in his private jet plane. These carbon offsets are meant to make uh, people feel uh, less guilty about their high-flying lifestyles. Although Hollywood's influence is massive, a more powerful force has even more say over what you buy and how you live. The threat from climate change is serious, it is urgent, and it is growing. The Green Revolution has taken hold in Democrat-controlled Washington. And it's no wonder in the 2008 election cycle, environmental groups gave Democrats nearly all of their $2.8 million in donations. We will create a green revolution with investments in biofuels, wind, solar, geothermal. There is a very close relationship between uh, the Democratic Party and the uh, environmental pressure groups. As long as the money keeps flowing in, Democrats will keep pushing green as the way to solve the world's problems. The only reason many of these green uh, products and these green industries have started is because of the government decided this is what we should do rather than the free market. And we know that when the government decides versus a free market, it's going to be wasteful, it's going to be probably illogically put together, and guess what? Most of these projects aren't. But with the fear of doomsday scenarios pushed by the Al Gores of the world, Americans continue to sink their money one green thing after another with not much to show for it other than the swelling bank accounts of those selling the products. At the end of the day, uh, if, we, if we adopt the green economy that President Obama keeps talking about, we're going to be poorer and uh, we're not going to have a better environment. And we will continue to follow these important stories, but that is all the time we have tonight. As always, thank, thank you for joining us.